Life and music take you interesting places. And recently, I had the chance to visit one of the most exciting cities I've ever set foot in. Berlin. It's a place of history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. A place of culture and arts, some of the best of which is painted straight onto the city's walls. And a place of food naturally. And yes, there were a few beers along the way. Berlin is also a city where music, technology, and socioeconomics collided to give birth in one of the most electrifying and eclectic music scenes in the world. And standing in the middle of this intricate patchwork of brutalist and classic architecture, I kept asking myself why, after living for most of my life in close proximity to this amazing city, it took me so long to come here. It's this collision between music and technology that brought me here to Berlin, and more specifically in the Kreuzberg, a vibrant neighborhood covered in murals and renowned for its food, relaxed atmosphere, and people watching. This is where Tatsuo Takahashi, aka Tats, and his team have established Cork Berlin and developed a very unusual acoustic synthesizer, the Phase 8. And today, the Cork Berlin team is opening its doors to us to give us an insider's look at the creative space and tell us more about the Phase 8. Let's meet Tats. My name is Tats, uh, Tatsu Takahashi. I am currently CEO of Cork Berlin. Prior to my position here, I worked in Tokyo for 10 years at headquarters. I worked on the Volkers, Minilog, Monolog, the Arp Odyssey, predominantly uh, the, the analog stuff. Founded in 1962 by Tsuto Mokato and Tadashi Osanai, Korg has established itself as one of the leading forces in the musical instruments manufacturing industry. However, Walking into the offices of Cork Berlin felt less like entering the headquarters of an international corporation than walking into a creative lab slash recording studio slash startup incubator. So what's the difference between Korg and Cork Berlin? The way we've phrased it publicly is that Cork Berlin shares much of the DNA that Korg itself has, but we have the autonomy to do it differently. That is very, very accurate because when we started Cork Berlin, they didn't tell us what to do or we should be doing. They were just saying, hey, start a company, make some products. And in not having a brief or not having instructions on what to do, that itself was the spirit of Korg. Because if you look at how headquarters works in Tokyo, we have multiple teams. We have guitar products, we have pianos, accompaniment keyboards, workstations, analog synths, digital synths, apps. And frankly speaking, not all of them are successful. But in keeping those, all those different threads alive, it becomes an amalgam, it becomes a bigger whole. And I think our very existence is actually the, the style of Korg. The fact that we have autonomy, that we have our own thread, is very much the Korg style, even though the Phase 8 maybe looks very different to the other Korg products that you see. When we started Korg Berlin, in hindsight, it was a crazy idea. I am so grateful for the faith that Cork had in me to start this. They got me a synth engineer and they were like, start a company. We did loads of pilot projects. And one of them was, let's make a synth that isn't purely electronic. And this is the one that stuck and this is the one that turned into a phase eight that we've just announced at Superbooth. Phase 8 is a synthesizer that uses acoustic synthesis, that's what we've called it. And acoustic synthesis is our way of going beyond purely electronics as a means to make sound. What it's actually doing in practical terms is it's exciting a physical body, the stainless steel resonators, 
by hitting it with a hammer. And this hammer isn't a mechanical one, it's an electromagnetic one. It's a coil and we pulse the current through it and it moves the, the resonator, it excites it. And the vibrations that are happening in the resonator um, are picked up by a capacitive pickup. The novel thing is that we, rather than just putting a pickup on an otherwise acoustic instrument, we've integrated this system into the synthesis itself, which is the electronic part. So we have things like envelope control, we have things like infinite sustain, we have things like harmonic modulation. And all of these things can't exist without the other half. So there's like the, the electronic part to it and there's the acoustic part to it. So all the synthesis that's happening is really blending the acoustic world and electronic world together. That's the basis of phase eight um, or the, the sound generation in phase eight. And phase eight itself is actually put together as a kind of groove box format. So it has a sequencer on it, it has automation, it has sync. It's made to be kind of jammed on with, with other gear. But that's not the only possibility. I think we've developed acoustic synthesis uh, in a way that it can be rolled out to maybe it's a keyboard instrument, maybe it's a, an effects processor. So it, it could be very many things. And we thought to really kind of unleash and also test out the, the sound engine, we thought the Groovebox format was, was the best first product for us. Phase 8 is called Phase 8 because we failed seven times before and on the eighth we got it right. So we, we have many, many stories of, of things not working. I mean, you know, most of the time things don't work. Before we had these stainless steel resonators, we call them, or tines, we were working with brass and other materials. We had piezo pickups, we had uh, even optical pickups. We tried so many different things. And I guess the biggest challenge was maybe the sound, getting the sound right. It's so easy to fall into this uh, illusion that when something is technically very cool that it's going to make a good instrument and, and that's not always the case. If it doesn't sound good it's just there's no point in doing it. We had multiple realizations where we were like oh my god this is so cool we're activating all these different harmonics and we can modulate them individually but at one point we said but hey it's actually sounding pretty boring so we kind of scrapped all of that and started again. So we've done that seven times. That's why it's phase eight. We didn't want to just make another synth that was like the others because they're all great, you know, and we wanted to find purpose in what we do and, uh, and we wanted to change how music is made or how instruments are made or how people perform. And I only really take credit for that initial impulse. And the rest of it was, was so collaborative and was so informed uh, by the team that we have today, be it the circuitry or the shape of the resonators, the material, the way we drive it, the algorithms that work out all the feedback, the synthesis, that's all on the team. It's just a, like a hive mind uh, putting everything together and we've melded so well. So that bit I'm, I'm probably most proud, maybe I'm proud of the team more than the, the product. We're a small team, but we pretty much have the facilities for developing a product, putting it into mass production, doing everything peripheral to the product, like you know, writing the manual, these kind of mundane things that come with putting a product out. And of course, all the communication side of things, which is everything from the branding, website, running Superbooth, we do that all ourselves. You know? And I think that's really been the key for everything to have a consistency from, from the public messaging, to the product, to the features, to the manual as well. Superbooth is a show that because it's in Berlin, it's very important for us. It's a great show slash festival slash, I don't know, it's everything in one. We love Superbooth. And from the logos that you see to the printed material, to the tea that we're serving, to even the stand that we're serving the tea in is designed and built by us. And if you come and see us, you can talk to the engineers who, who works on it. You can talk to the people who perhaps did the the design for it or who designed the resonators or who wrote the code for all the synthesis or who did the analog circuitry for the wave folding. And I think people notice and, and we, we want to keep it that way. So at Superbooth, we just showed phase eight in basically its final form. And that means that we've 
tooled up. So all the samples that you saw at Superbooth, they're from the factory, they're from the actual molds that will do the mass production. And tooling is a massive commitment, both financially and, and, and technically. Everything gets locked in, all the features get locked in, the shapes, the industrial design, the size of the screw holes, everything gets locked in at that point. So as scary as it is, it's a big relief for us. I think when you're doing very research heavy uh, development, it's easy to get lost and it's easy to get frustrated and easy to not know whether there's any point in doing this or is it good or is it bad. And we've had so many moments of, of doubt that getting that incredible response from the people who came to Superbooth and, and online as well is exhilarating. It's, it's the most wonderful moment to, to be in. As our interview was nearing its end, I just had to ask Tats about some of the incredible gear that was surrounding us in the studio. And that led to one of my favorite moments of the interview. Just listen. So right now we're sitting in, in this studio at Cork Berlin. We have a bunch of stuff here, quite a random assortment of, of synths that we like to play on, but also that are kind of useful for testing as well. So it's very handy to have a, a semi-patchable synth where you kind of got a voice ready, but you want to patch in like a circuit that you're developing. There are some like practical considerations in, in picking the gear that sits in this room. This thing is, oh, this is actually still a prototype. It's not actually the, the final version, um, which is out now. But the 3300 um, was designed by Fumio Mieda. He, he, is, he is the analog master at Korg, and he still comes into work every day. So when I first started at Korg in Tokyo, I worked on a couple of projects, but the first project that I really felt like I owned was the Monotron. And when I put together the circuit for it, Mr. Mieda said, looked at my schematic and said, your circuit works fine. It works fine on paper and the specs are good, but it's not musical. And that was, you know, I thought, ouch. That's <laughs> but um, it was a, a, a big lesson because after he said that to me, I looked at his circuits and I studied his, his designs extensively. His designs are, are very punk, you know, it's hard to see that from the outside, but take the MS20 filter, for example, that he designed, and you, you put a transistor uh, and, and you use it in a way that's, that it's not meant to be used in. And it's got this very kind of, if it works and if it sounds good, then all is good. Kind of very kind of, yeah, I would say punk. Kind of very punk electronic engineering attitude. And that's one thing that, I, that was, a, was a big, big lesson for me. Some circuits have to work, they have to be good uh, in spec, but to make an instrument, you kind of have to go beyond that and do some things that are wrong to make it interesting. And so I do feel like that spirit does live in uh, the acoustic synthesis, which we have in phase eight. And with these closing words, it was time to pack our cameras, drink a cocktail, and head back to our hotel to get ready to return to New York. Looking at Berlin one last time from the rooftop of the Klunke Kranich, an amazing cultural space and bar with the best views of the city, I found myself reminiscing on the amazing week we had just spent here, discovering amazing new instruments, making new friends, and as the sun went down on the rooftops, I made myself and the city a promise. I'll be back, Berlin. I'll be back.